for Crimea Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his column titled, Israel's Lawless Attacks Cannot Continue If We Want International Peace, Part 2. You argue that a rules-based international order depends on a consensus between states supporting that legality. So do you think there is any hope of achieving that? Well, before, at the present moment, you have a relationship between the United States and its allies and most other states of the world where the United States and its allies block back everything that Israel does, do not bring Israel to order when they violate international law. So you need a situation where you don't have a so-called unipolar world, where you have negotiations between states to secure the peace. And in this situation, what has been significant in the period since the January 26th case is that the global south, which is just a really a name most of the time, emerged as an important player. It A lot of states from the global south have come out in support of the South African case. Some of them have joined as parties to the case. The organization of Islamic states, the organization of Arabic states, the non-aligned movement, uh, a number of these movements, some that have been uh, not dormant, but relatively inactive for some time, felt moved by this. And there's a video where Angela Davis is interviewed on this website called Mondo Vice, and she says that what South Africa did in this case is they were perceived as giving a voice to the global South, and that can be a factor in reconfiguring international relations. And I'm saying, once you reconfigure international relations, you have a better chance of ensuring that law rules in relations between states and that a state like Israel can't just get away with doing what it likes and ignoring the law. To what extent is US hegemony actually being challenged? And is it not still the only show in town? It wouldn't have seemed that it was being challenged before January 26th. And uh, it had a block of states behind it, UK, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But since January the 26th, you've definitely seen some shifts. Uh, one example is about a week ago or 10 days ago, there was a Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire just for Ramadan, which was almost over at that point. But no state voted against, not even the United States. The United States abstained. United Kingdom, the closest ally of the United States, voted with the motion. Other examples are that some of the Western states, you know, when a few, a month or so back, the um, Israel said that it wants, it attacked the UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Welfare, whatever it is, the main source for humanitarian aid to people in situations like that in Gaza. And they said some of them were involved in the attack of October the 7th. They never produced proof. And the United States backed Israel. But gradually, a, a number of the states who are classified as being part of the Western Alliance have resumed aid to UNRWA, and it's unclear whether others may still do it. So there are indications that the United States may not be the only show in town, that there is, even within the West, their disagreements. But even but within each, each of these Western states, there's massive opposition of the population. It says in just about every one of these states, the United States, UK, France, if I remember correctly, 
that the majority of the population want a ceasefire and they disapprove of this war. Also, Raymond, you seem to place a lot of weight on the global south. So to what extent can it be seen as a counter force or a balancing force in relation to the US and the Western allies? Well, I did mention that uh, the a number of these states in organization on their own and in organizational form have come out in defense of the Palestinians. They've surfaced the Palestinian struggle. For many decades, this, uh, the, there was a sort of erasure of the Palestinians. People don't know that the Palestinians have got a massive cultural output, lots of great poets, novelists, and so forth. And what really happened through that case is that the Palestinians became more present in their own name, using their own voices, not speaking through someone else. Edward Said once said, we must tell our own story. And the person who quoted in the New York Times recently said, Peter Beinart, that only 1% of authors of article about, articles about Palestinians are the Palestinians themselves. So I see the surfacing of the Palestinians as being a result of the support of the global south. You've got Namibia bringing a separate case against Germany. You've got uh, Nicaragua being, bringing a separate case. And there's a lot of complexity to the... They, they are playing a sort of divide and rule in reverse in the sense that Germany backing Israel is supposed to be related to the Nazi Holocaust. But now they are practicing, uh, they're calling it anti-Semitism when they persecute the Palestinians. And the, the Namibians have said, you, we are opposing, are we going to bring a case against uh, Germany? Because Germany has never properly atoned for the genocide they committed against the Herero and the Nama in 1908. So there's a whole lot of these things happening, bubbling. But you know, the global south is not like one force. Saudi Arabia is part of the global south. Now, Saudi Arabia is not the same as the more uh, left-leaning states, things like that. So it's one must understand, and this is the same with consensus genuinely, doesn't mean you agree on everything, but the global south has become come an important force for this Palestinian issue, but it may be a prelude to reconfiguring international relations. And lastly, to what extent are Palestinians, wherever they are located, part of this contestation? When I said that the Palestinians have been surfaced by this case, what you can see if you look at the literature, even the uh, conventional Western literature, you see a lot of Palestinian voices, Palestinians who live in the diaspora outside uh, Middle East. I mean, some parts of the United States, I think, I can't remember if it's Chicago, but some of them, majority of the population in some of these places of of Palestinians, or they're the largest concentration of Palestinians in the world. Germany has got a huge number of Palestinians. So the Palestinians have now come into their own. Uh, everyone is wearing a kefir. I'm not wearing it around here because I don't want to get clapped by someone if I wear a kefir and the, let's say the Palestinian colors and say and shout out uh, between the river and the sea, Palestine must be free. Now, very few people knew the colors of the Palestinians. Very few people knew uh, about kafirs being associated with the Middle East, but very few people knew that phrase that has been banned in uh, Germany, uh, Israel, I can't remember, one, one other Western states, but some universities have banned from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. They suggest it's um, exhortation 
to uh, killing the Jew, the Israelis. Israelis are not Jew, they're only Jews. They're just some of the Jews living there. And a lot of Arabs live there under bad conditions. That was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to criminal media's policy about Israel's law. Our text cannot continue if we want international peace. Part two.